Um, all right. So you had an essay uh, that's due uh, about the connections. And you had to find a depth connection. And the next essay coming up is concerning an article that is in work folder two called Program for Love. All right. Now that article is longer. It's longer than, uh, you know, the farewell my mailbox one and the homeless turned into Wi-Fi hotspots one put together like twice over. It's 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 a bit longer. It's a bit demanding. Just a, just a little bit more. It's 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 certainly something I, I know you can understand. It's just you're, you're going to have to put in about twenty to twenty five minutes to read it carefully, to think about it. All right, and it starts off kind of like a, an interview. It's not structured like an interview, you know. But 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 they're they're focusing on the views of one person. Her name is Sherry Turkle, and she has some things to say about computers, about uh, the way what our needs are as human beings. Uh, we need friends, we need communication, you know, we need a community that, that sort of does connect to the ar articles we used in work folder one. We, we need each other, right? But um, we are entering an age where the, the tools, the devices that, that we can use are the type that will allow us to have a sort of relationship to meet some of those needs that we have, but but not with 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 other real humans or with um, the real flesh and blood blood person in the room. Okay, it's it's a it's a bit dated. Again, you know, don't I'm not too concerned about the fact that these articles are getting old. And um, just a quick time out. I see that there's a question here about the nonfiction narrative extra credit assignment. I'll try to get that to. to to, to that as soon as I finish up here. Um, let me keep on going about this, this program for love uh, essay or article that you need to read and think about. I want you to read that for Monday, okay? And it, it is a, a bit dated, but that's okay because it makes a great teaching tool, all right? I know why I'm using it. I know what I wanna point out. I know it's gonna help us take the a, 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 an, another step into growing in terms of how we think about text and how we can watch authors make it make texts so please read that, read it carefully, and it would be good if you helped me start off on Monday with questions about it, you know, and, 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 and uh, I, I need to know uh, what you think the main point is, like the, the overarching point. And then I also want to talk about the, 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 the general sort of sub points that are used to support the overarching point. So um, Try to find those, get a, get a sense of what it's about and be ready to discuss this on Monday, all right? Now, to give you some more information about the connections essay and why we're doing that, I, I wanna say that I'm using these smaller essays that I'm giving you to, to, to give you techniques to think about in terms of how to write an interesting research paper for me. So let's, let's talk about those terms, all right? When I say research paper, I'm talking about an intertextual paper, okay? I N T E R, intertextual. In other words, you're you are you are able to 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 get sources and to bring them into your paper so that your paper is referring to other books and articles as well as your own idea, all right? So, in order to find those those other voices if you will, you have to go and look for them, all right? in the library or in books that you have maybe have already read, maybe material from other classes, maybe a movie or a documentary you've watched, certainly online material, okay? So in a very, very basic sense for our purposes, you know, that's that's kind of the type of research I want us to start off on. And that is just, can you, can you just start uh, reading, watching, keeping your eyes open as you move through your life for the next couple of weeks remembering the topic that you picked and trying to see if you can find material that you can bring into your paper to make it a little more uh, <clears throat> robust, if you will, you know. And so, yes, I do want you to start thinking, you, you should already be thinking of a topic to write on, right? Uh, that is your, that's your research paper topic. And um, now the question is, well, what exactly, how do I, how do I go about writing that? What do I do with that? What, how do I, what, what can I have more of a guideline, right? And I'm like, well, 
not not really because that's that's the point here is i want us to learn how to invent how to invent the map that helps you write it so this this is going to be a, a a stepping beyond you know the traditional idea of hey you can take your research paper you can divide it into five paragraphs you know and the first paragraph is going to tell me my, your topic and then maybe you can end with a thesis maybe the thesis can mention three like points or something right and then the second pa paragraph can be one of those supporting points the third one can be the another one the fourth one can be another one and then the fifth you can you can close it up and then you can remind the reader that your readers what you wrote about you can maybe repeat your thesis maybe reword it but repeat it and then and then let's go you're done so see that's that's a map right that's, that sounds like a plan and it does help you produce a text but because it's so easy to teach and it's easy to understand, it kind of gets overused. And, and you might be at the point now where that's really all you know how to write is like that, that way. And I want us to move beyond that. Okay. So that's why last time on the board there, remember I said, let's think more in terms of sections. All right. And then the sections in terms of the paragraphs you need in there and, and stuff like that. And let's also talk about, you know, argumentative techniques. Okay, so uh, I, let's 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 focus on this notion of what is a persuasive paper, what is an argument paper. So I'm going to try to get this little board back over here now. Uh, Bremen, you asked about the nonfiction narrative extra credit. I haven't forgot about that. It's right there. I'm I, I'm going to see if I can get to it. And if I don't get to it today, for sure on Monday, uh, I can maybe do a video on that as well, right? And post a video in the next couple of days, let's see if I can do that. Okay, but let's let's talk about argument, all right? So, um, okay, an argument for our purposes, okay, I, I, want, I want us to expand it because you might be thinking, well, an argument is really sort of, uh, you know, it's got two sides or a couple sides to, to an issue and and, and the sides are like talking at each other and presenting logic and data for their viewpoint on, on this position, right? The position they have. The, and they're trying to convince others, you know, that they have a point that they, maybe that they're right, right? Now, it, it, for that, that that is that is one type of argument, but it's a very narrow sense, okay? I, again, I want us to work with a better, a bigger definition for us, okay? And this is, Let's just say an argument is an act, a linear explanation of and I need I need that to say of of, of a. Let's see if I can do this without messing. So there we go. Of a uh, um, non obvious observation okay so an argument is a linear explanation of a non-obvious observation all right so if you make an observation about something like if i tell you you know america americans really like going to the movies i think i think every single one of you listening to me right now is just going to be willing to believe that to grant me that now you might know people that really might not like going to the movies but you know as a whole all you have to do is look at the industry i mean that, that we, we don't let weak industries survive here in america i mean that, that, that's proof enough that uh that this that this is we like to watch movies whether it's netflix whether it's at the movie theater, whatever we like, we like stories, we like movies. Okay. But, uh, it, so at that point, I, that's not a statement that's worth research, right? That's, that's an obvious statement. Now you can, you can, you can back it up with a lot of facts, but I'm going to be sitting here listening, reading that and saying, why are you bothering to write this? I think your audience is going to give you this point if you just said it to them. So I want you, if I haven't mentioned this in the last uh, lecture or whatever, I, I I should have. I'm going to mention it now. I want you to remember the 100 people in the room idea, okay? You got a big room right here, and you got 100 people. And if I were a little more off my rocker, I'd, I'd sit here and actually draw them all out. 
sometimes I feel like I want to do that, but I'm just going to put the word 100 in there. You got 100 people in there, and you have a space up in the front. You got a, you've got the podium. If you went up there at the top and you said, I need 20 minutes of your time, all right, because that's about the size of a decent research. I need 20 minutes of your time. I'm going to read this thing aloud. And then you start off with something obvious like that. You know, it's like, why do we need to listen to that? Okay. So, but, but um, what, what if, what if somebody got up there and said, um, the, the average American deals with death by going to the movies. Now, right now, how many of you are going to just automatically agree with that? The average American deals with death by going to the movies. At that point, I might have 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 people there saying, well, I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you know, I can understand the words. I understand what you said, but whether it's true or false, I, I don't I don't know. It's not obvious to me. What's, why are you thinking that way? Right. So I've come up with an observation that I think needs unpacking. All right. It needs an explanation. That's why it's, it's sort of like a conclusion to beliefs and ideas that come before it in my mind. Now, that, that's an argument. It's the result of those preceding ideas and, and, and beliefs and observations. You know, they, they all work together to lead it to, to a conclusion, right, to a, a big idea. And the big idea is supported by those little guys, you know. So that's that's really an argument in a nutshell. Why, why make it more complicated than it is, right? And when it's not obvious, that's that's when you can bring in all sorts of things to back up your point, right? You can work with definitions. You can bring logic in. You can bring facts in, data. You know, you can bring testimony from the authorities. You know, somebody that's written a book on it, and that's what they say. You know, you can. So um, what you're doing is you're trying to show your line of reasoning that led you to this belief. And the belief is not an obvious belief. That's how come this room is waiting for more information before they agree or disagree, right? And when 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 I say linear, it, what I mean is that you know you can often imagine yourself trying to trying to think of how to convince this person of of, of the validity of your observation by thinking, well, first I got to tell them this, and then maybe I need to tell them that, and then they they would appreciate if if I gave them this next. You can think in terms of what you need to tell them first. How you need to educate them so that they can see your point. Okay. Now, for me, that's an argumentative essay, right? And at this point, you can see that the old idea of picking a controversial issue like gun control or abortion or, you know, there's so many of them immigration, uh, college tuition, you know, should we cancel student debt, all that. Um, that is one type of a non-obvious observation that might need unpacking in a linear way. But there are so many other ways to do it. And one technique is to, is to think of a connection between two items that don't seem to be connected at all. So if I, if I were to tell you that YouTube and coffee are connected, that, they're, that they share a deep connection, how, how many of you are ready to agree with me on that? Because you you're like, well, I'm not even going to bother with that because it's obviously kind of it feels like a trick question. You know, it feels like he knows what he's talking about. It. And whether he does or not, that's his illusion. But I'm, I'm not going to challenge that. Like, yeah, yeah, you're right, because I, I do think there's a connection. All right. And but because it's a, it's not obvious, I got to get up there and I, I need to say, well, here, let's let's start with the fact on how coffee changes your your brain chemistry and how the more you drink it the more your brain actually wants it and the more it's willing to reward you for getting more caffeine in there, right? And how do I know that? Because I wrote a book by a really great writer called Michael Pollan, and the book is called This Is Your Mind on Plants. And he divides that book into three parts, and the third one is all about coffee and what it does to your head, okay, what it does. Uh, well, that's that's where I'm headed, Olivia. But... Um, I can draw that out a little bit more and show you how YouTube is connected. Uh, it, it addicts you the same way coffee does. All right. Um, and then there's a book out there called um, Like, Comment, sub Subscribe. And it's, it's about the history of YouTube and what they did with the algorithm that, that, that they designed to show you. Yeah, okay. I, I just got that book from the library. Yeah. Um, 
that's a pretty good book. Uh, you know, that's a book that you can actually read like a halfway through and you can start skimming because you realize that they've already made the point and the rest of it is just kind of backing it up. And, but anyway, um, YouTube, you know, there's something that goes on with, with, uh, this, this is a, they're researching this, but it, it seems that the more you use it, the more that your brain is somehow rewarded by the stuff it's showing you the, 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 the next video it, it presents to you is based on the amount of videos that you've watched that are in of that same type. And it's, it's starting to reward you re realizing that you like a certain type of thing. And it's, it's, it's causing that thing to get augmented. Okay. So I'm, I'm connecting the two, right? I'm connecting coffee with YouTube and I think I could write a paper on it. Right. And, and I, I think I could have the beginning, the middle, the end. I think I could unpack it by referring to these books. I would make it sort of like research in that way. I could, and uh, I think with, with this paper, I can create interest, maintain it and reward it. And that's really all you have to do when you're, when you, when you write is you have to learn how to do those three things, create interest, maintain it, reward it. I think I can do it with those two, but I, I would also like to present another connection to you. I think the college diploma that you're earning is like the plastic bottle that is right now rolling down the street because it's empty and it's gonna, now I actually have a, a, a really nice thing I think I can build through that, right? It, it's not overly negative, so I, I don't wanna get you discouraged about that. But I, I do think that the same things that draw us towards these two items is really the same at the bottom, okay? Um, so, you know, if, if I have to, if I have, if I can come up with an observation that I know before anybody just automatically believes me, they got to know what I'm talking about in terms of definitions, ideas, facts, the thoughts I'm having, and I need to explain those thoughts in a certain way, then, then I basically have an argumentative paper, okay? Um, now, when, when we talk about persuasive, sometimes we use it in terms of a debate. Sometimes we, we ask people to be really convinced on their position and try to make other people see that they're right. And I, I want us to broaden this notion of persuasion as well, okay? What I want you to do with your paper, okay, is I want you to, to realize that you're gonna have to work with a spectrum of possibility. So uh, I'm gonna put a dot here and another one over here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna fill, fill that one up. I hope you can see that, but, but this, is, uh, this is zero, this is one. If you want numbers, you would put zero and you put one there. And this is uh, the probability scale, okay? So if something is very, very improbable, it's like right here, you know, right on this end, like 0 0.003 is very low on the probability scale. If something is almost certain, okay, it might be 0.9999, it might be right over here. But this, this, this is all about possibilities, right? Is, is it possible? Because if it's impossible, right? then it's going to be zero. There is, there's no chance of it being true or being a thing, uh, you know, zero possible pro that, that it's right or whatever. If it's, if it's certain, like five plus five plus five is 15, that has a probability factor of one, you know, is this, that's, that's a, that's a sure thing. You see what I'm saying? I, I don't need you to try to convince me that you're right. I need you to show me that your observation is possible. It's gotta be on this scale somewhere. You gotta show me that you're not out of your mind, you know, or that you're not just picking crazy stuff out of the air in, a, in an absurd, absurd sort of way. There's, there's gotta be some reasoning that you have behind it, right? And it, it kind of might be sort of maybe a, a long shot, but, but it, it might actually be the case, you know? So you gotta first show me that your observation is possible. And then as you talk about it more and bring in some extra stuff from the outside, you know, maybe some movies, documentaries, some books, some quotes, I don't know, right? You, you start moving this over to the left to the, it starts getting more and more probable. And I think that's really a good paper, okay? Look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you my thinking here. I, I'm out of stuff to draw on the board, but, but uh, let me tell you this as well. Anything that I throw out here by way of example or what not, not even if I came up with it, if you want to run with it as a research paper, you're welcome to do that because I feel like that can help some students grow, you know, and I'm fine with that. If you want to come up with your own idea, that's okay. If you just can't, I want you to think about it for a while, but if, if you want to run with something that I say, I'm happy to provide that for you. you you're, you're welcome to do that. 
And I have plenty of others that are ideas that I know I'm never going to write on. So you're welcome to have some of these. But here, here's an idea for you, right? I was just reading this the other day. In fact, today, no, today, I was just reading about uh, a little article I found somewhere, just flipping through a magazine, and um, it's about fear of flying, okay? So some people really struggle with fear of flying. Is, is, is that worth a research paper? Well, I, I don't think that alone is because I think your audience is going to kind of just give that to you. You know what I mean? We have enough experience in life and America and with airports and with people that we just know what 10% of people are afraid of flying. I don't know, you know, um, but, but here's, you know, here's where it might get interesting. And that is people are trying to figure out solutions to this, right? Now, one obvious solution is just to get drunk. So that's why airports, you know, they, you're allowed to drink in an airport before the flight. You're, you're allowed to have three or four or five glasses if you want to, you know, and then you get on the flight and maybe you can buy some more beer there, you know, and, and they know some people are just going to do that and it, it relaxes them and all of that. So there's, there's that, right. You can, you can always take a drug. Um, but others want to conquer this at a deeper level. Right. And so uh, there's a solution right now, or like, no, not a solution, but there's, there's something going on where you can, you can pay some money. Right. And you can talk to an actual pilot. Um, you can you can you can phone up a pilot and talk to a pilot for like 30 minutes about what's what's going on in the airplane and you know all that and and maybe that'll help you not be so scared of flying if, if you're one of these people and you know that they're they're making so much money that <laughs> the magazine uh or or, or they, they made the news in in, in essence you know the, the company right all right. So, yeah, you talk to a pilot. I don't know if that works or not. But see, what I know is that people are looking for solutions to this, right? They're looking for solutions. So if I were actually to, to read about all the solutions that are out there, see, that's research, right? I got to go figure out what are some ways people deal with this, you know? Uh, what are some, you know, things people have come up with that might help other people? I got to read about the, the, the cures because as far as I know, no one has actually cured it, okay? But then, uh, you know, I did I did come up with an idea, all right? And I think that this idea is pretty unique. I'm going to share it with you, all right? So those of you that know about chemistry, about physics, about electricity, about the human body, you know that we actually have a lot of electricity in us right now. I mean, that's how we think. That's how our heart beats. That's how, you know, there's, there's electricity in us. There's obviously electrons because we are made out of, uh, you know, atoms and, uh, now, you know, we're not conductors. We're not very good conductors. We, we do conduct electricity. That's why we get electrocuted when we touch the wrong wires. But, uh, you know, copper has this beat 100 times over. But, but anyway, you know, we still have a lot of electrons going on. We still have a lot of electric activity, especially in our head, okay, and especially in our head. And um, so if you know fit the basic physics, what, what happens when you, when you move a pile of wires, a coil of wires through a magnetic field? When you move, when you move that pile of wires to a magnetic field, a magnetic field, um, you, you produce a current. Okay, you produce a current. And I don't know if you've done that experiment. You know, there's a couple ways you can show this to a science class. You know, but that's how generators work. Like I got this fan right here. You know, because it's just so incredibly hot. You know, I got this fan. Well, well a fan is basically just that. It's a, it's a coil of wires with a magnet, right? And when electricity shoots through those wires. Some, something has to move. Either the, the current, is, the, the wires move or the, the, the magnet moves because the current affects the situation, right? And in this case, the magnet is moving and it's moving the shaft of the fan and I'm getting some air. But uh, it's a very common concept, all right? When you, move, when you move electricity, electrons, when you move electrons through a magnetic field, you get electricity, okay? Now, isn't the Earth a big magnet? The Earth's a big magnet. We've got an electric field in us. We've got electrons all over the place, especially in our head. So what happens when you have a very, very small movement, like when I go from this room downstairs to make some tea or something, right? The movement is so small, probably nothing happens because it's just too, it's too, the scales are, are, are way, way off. I mean, it's, it's, it's just too huge, you know, uh, for, for that little, that little movement from here downstairs to my kitchen is negligible. I may as well have stayed put in terms of how the Earth's magnetic field is affecting me. Well, what happens when I get on a plane and I get 
up in the air, you know, five miles high, and I go 800 miles, and then I come back down through that that Earth's magnetic field. Don't you think that that could affect some people's, chem, you know, electrons in their head, and that might be producing the fear? All right. Okay. So I feel like I have something here that's not immediately obvious to people that I might be able to show as a possibility. Right. And then I, I can hear someone in the room raising their hands and saying, well, Matt, if that's the case, then we should all feel that. And I say, I think we all do, but some of us respond to that activity differently. Some of us, that extra current or whatever that's happening to us as we move through the magnetic field as an electric body, it doesn't really bother us. But for some people, it drives them crazy. Right. And I think I can point to football for support for this. I can look at the book called League of Denial. That's where the movie Concussion came from. Because you, if you study concussions, you realize that that hormone that gets released during that constant cro chronic hitting of the head over time builds up. The tau protein builds up. And for some football players, it's going to ruin their lives. It destroys their brains. For others, that protein does, does almost nothing. They, they're doing fine. They're 60 years old and they're doing fine. CTE, that's right. CTE affects chronic... Uh, traumatic encephalopathy, I think, something like that. Um, the, the trauma to hit the, those hits to their brain uh, didn't really mess with their brain the way it messed with like 20% of the players, you know? And, and so I, what I would say is, is like, yeah, I know like all of us that are on that plane are moving through the electric field. Uh, magnetic field. And so we're all experiencing this, this added charge or, or the turbulence in our heads, if you will, of, of elect, ele added changing electricity. And it's just like those football players where they're all getting that hit on their heads, those linemen, but only 20 to 30% develop CTE to the extent that, that it kills them. The others, yeah, they, they seem to be doing fine. Like Steve Young, you know, you know, Steve Young, uh, wasn't he the quarterback for the 49ers, an incredible quarterback right after John Elway? I mean, the guy was knocked senseless, man. I mean, time after time. In fact, uh, the, the last time he was on the field, I think he was flat on his back, knocked out because he was just taking hit after hit after hit. And you know where the guy is right now? The guy's leading some hedge fund. I mean, he's like a multimillionaire and he's, he's advising people on stocks and all that. You know, it's not my thing, but I know that that's very intelligent. That's You, you got to have a head on your shoulders and you can look at a lot of pros that went through the old school, the old school football, you know, and, 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 and they seem to be doing fine. I mean, John, John Madden is one of them. He was afraid of flying, but, you know, so, um, you know, you know, some, some of those players are going to be really affected by this. Some aren't. Now, the, the tricky thing is the players don't know yet. I mean, we don't know how to determine it yet. You know what I'm saying? So everyone's kind of scared because, you know, am I going to turn when I'm 40? Or 45, am I gonna am I gonna sense this coming on? Like like Brett Favre is the classic example, man. Brett, Brett Favre's scared out of his mind. You know, he's 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 talks about this because he feels he's getting more depressed. He feels he's forgetting things, and he's he he feels he might be on the track for you know full blown CTE. Um, but but other retired professionals aren't. You know, I really don't see Tom Brady experiencing anything. You know, and the guy's like 40 what 42 something like that. So um, you know that's that's what I mean. You know, uh, sometimes our brains are affected for, for some people have their brains affected a certain way and some pe other people don't. We see this in football. So might not just be with fear of flying for some people moving th through that electric field does affect them this way. Now, listen, I have no proof on this. OK, everything I just shared with you is all like theory, but it, it seems to make a sword, a, a sort of a, a weird sort of sense to me, especially because of what I know with electromagnetism and with physics, right? And when I did a, a, a review of literature, look, a research a, a research survey on this, so what I mean by that is I, I tried to find if there were any articles on this in the library, any books that talked about this idea about moving your head, this electric thing of ours through a huge magnetic field over distances that matter because they're so big, you know, that airplane flight from here to Texas or whatever, that, that that really will affect something um, as opposed to me getting in my car and driving a mile. I mean, given the size of the earth, that's nothing, right? I'm not gonna feel any fear. Yeah, I've got, 
an, an electric head moving through a magnetic field, but it's negligible. But the airplane trip isn't. You know what I'm saying? So I feel like I feel like that's at least worth investigating. And I'm going to write this essay. And at the end, I'm going to call for further research, right? Because I know I'm not in a position to actually provide the research. All I can do is provide the theory, the idea. I got to show that it's possible. And, and where's my research? Well, it's kind of based on logic, based on what, what's true in electricity, what's, what's true in physics. It's kind of based on also what's true in concussions and how the brain works there. So I'm building a case, right? But it's far from settled. It's far from certain. It's just kind of moving. It's on here and it's kind of moving. It's getting better and better. And I know that this is actually something some of you can do. I know one of you can write this paper. It's, 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 it's not really that hard to write, but no one has written on this. I, I challenge you to go find an article that talks about this anywhere on, online or from the school databases or whatever. So what you have there is you have a genuine contribution um, that's a non-obvious observation that needed an explanation, right? That creates interest, maintains it, and rewards it. Bingo. You write something like that, I'm going to give you an A. All right. And your next class is going to give you an A because once, once you figure out how to do this sort of thing, you can do it over and over and over again. And you're just trying to figure out how to, uh, how to uh, come up with techniques, you know, that allows you to, to, to have unusual ideas, you know? So um, I, 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 uh, I want you to start thinking about your research paper in terms of, you know, uh, what you can do with it, what, what sort of questions you can come up with and how you would research it. And we'll, we'll go from there. Now, before I, I move on, does anybody have any questions about what I'm saying? N not necessarily about the whole, you know, fear of flying thing, but, but how, what I'm trying to uh, show or suggest the ways I want you to think about writing your paper in terms of, well, how, how should I actually go about this? You know, uh, for example, I think everyone should at least have a topic now, okay? But I, I'm gonna see if there's any hand raising or any questions on the, on the side here. Um, It's very, it's very hard to do this if you're not, if you're not already involved with content in your world. You know, that's why it's so important for you as a, as a, as a future leader, you know, as, as an emerging adult that is, is going to have a life ahead of you, a professional activity. It's, it's super important for you to, to stay in touch with, with texts. You know, you need to be reading, you need to be watching, you need to be listening. You also need to be having fun, you know, I understand that, but but you can't ignore one of those things and, and expect to grow in terms of a thinking machine, you know, that can come up with ideas and, and, and concepts. And and I, I want you to know it's it's a path that you can learn, okay? I, I know you can get this, it's just you have to kind of dedicate yourself to it in the long run, all right? Um, I'm, I'm 40, I'll be 49 in about three weeks, okay? I know I look like I'm 27, but I'm really, uh, 48. Uh, th that was my joke for the night. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, half the class left and they're not going to get it, but that's their loss. Anyway, anyway, um, I've, I've been doing this ever since I started teaching in 1996. Uh, aggressively reading the classics, fiction, and now for the last 10 years, nonfiction. But uh, if you if you were to start in earnest now, and again, if you were to read 20 minutes a day, five days a week, take two days off, but just dedicate yourself to reading stuff that you don't have to read outside of your regular classwork activities. Read a nonfiction book. There's so many of them out there. Don't get involved with one that's boring. Find one that's not boring. How do you know which one isn't boring? The jacket art. Yeah, the jacket art is good. And the title is intriguing because they're learning how to create interest even from the title. And you go to your library and just look at the shelves and pick one book that the title looks cool. Pick 10 of them. And then go through the 10 and find the one that, you know, actually seems like it's going to be a good read because it reads well. You know, you, you got to page three without even, it didn't even feel like it was pulling teeth or anything, you know. So I'm going to use this, that, that's the type of book that's going to help you get through the material because it's interesting, it's, it's easy to read, easy to understand, but you're learning. You're learning about somebody, about something, I don't know, but, you know, you're learning. That's the important part. And you're learning on your own. So that your education doesn't stop when your college stops, you see, because hopefully you all are going to graduate and be done with this. 
But the question is, are you going to be done truly growing as a thinker in a broad way? You know, sure, you'll continue learning stuff at your work. But are you going to be directing your own growth, you know, in terms of, of stuff you're looking at and watching and you're learning how to read people and to, and to understand what's happening, you know, around you? So I'm going to use this little spiel, if you will, to transition into a, a question that was here earlier about this nonfiction narrative extra credit thing, okay? So uh, I want this to be worth, oh, I'll say, let's say eight points, okay? Because remember, this class is out of 100. So, you know, that's, that's a good little bit of points. I'm going to make a note of that. So, because I, I have to, I have to make sure that I clear some of these things out. You know, I'm constantly fiddling and tinkering with the assignments. And I think that can be frustrating to some of you because it doesn't look like I've got everything right lined up just perfectly and everything. But I promise you, I'll be fair to you. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll try to run this, run, uh, have it so that your experience is a good experience for you. And if, if, if you feel uh, there's something I can do to make it better. You need to please reach out to me in email. We can talk. I'd love to do that. But um, fiction, uh, eight points. Now, wh what I want you to do here is I, I, I have that list. I think on work folder two or whatever. There's a list of books. And the reason that I have those books on there is because I think every one of those books has the high, high, a, a lot of potential to be a capturing book. What I mean by a capturing book is that it captures your attention. Okay. And I, I, I want you to check out, uh, well, I want you to look at the list, right? The list is numbered. <laughs> and I want you to pick two numbers, uh, seven and eight. I don't know. I mean, you, you pick it. two and five. And you go to number two and it's going to have a book associated with it. I want you to get that book. You go to number five and get the book there. Okay. Now, now, some of these numbers actually have two books listed. The reason for that is both of those books are small or they're easy to read. I mean, like they're really easy to read. There's a lot of white space that the author was using. It's kind of like a, oh, it's, or they're full of little hand-drawn pictures. Like a, there's a book on there called Arbitrary Stupid Goal. You'll never forget that book if you read it. But, you know, there's, there are a lot of pictures, a lot of drawings, and that adds to the book. I mean, there's a reason for all of that, but it's 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 really not a big book. So I thought, you know, I can I can put on another one. I think I paired arbitrary stupid goal with my mess is a bit of a life, uh, uh, and and that's an incredible book. Okay, but both of those books are kind of easy to read, and. All right, I see somebody got Salt, Sweat, and Tears. Yeah, that was a good book, wasn't it? Um, and that still is happening because just recently someone is now trying to go around the world in a in one of these boats alone. You know, I'm like, there's no way, <laughs> there is no way this guy's gonna make it. But but he's he's getting ready. It's a guy I think he's like 20 something. And so this book, Salt, Sweat, and Tears, it's about people that try to cross the ocean in a rowboat or no, not a, not a rowboat, excuse me, in a, in a um, well, that's, that's part of the challenge is you design a boat, but you're the only person on it, you know, so obviously, and, and it can't be like power driven. It has to be a sailboat. And, um, you know, you, you have to take your food and you have to figure this out and people die on this, you know, so, um, but you also, you got a history of, of this pursuit and then you, the guy who's writing it is actually like doing it. So you also get a narrative of his trip, you know, and uh, oh, my goodness, that was an incredible book. But um, see, with that book, you learn about people. You, not only do you learn about the ocean and about weather systems and about what makes a boat capsize and why a boat floats in the first place. Seriously, have, have you ever thought about that? I mean, take 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 a just just take a go, go, go to Home Depot and. And, 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 and no, you know what, I'm, I, you're, you're probably not going to do this, right? But, but, but if you were to go there and, and buy a pipe, you know, a pipe or a nail, just get a nail, right? A nail and drop the nail in your bathtub. The nail is like, what? A 50th of a pound or something? And it sinks right to the bottom. Well, if the nail sinks, wh wh why does a huge hunking piece of metal that weighs like 100 tons, why does that float? And it all has to do with the shape. It's as simple as that. It's incredible. It's an incredible thing about physics, about life. I mean, about the earth, you know, the way earth works, nature. That you take that piece of metal and you shape it the right way, the thing floats. 
If you shape it the wrong way, it sinks. Boom. And so you learn a lot about that, right? But you also learn about people. It's a it's a little micro treatise on psychology and what makes a certain group of people tick and why they're doing this, you know. Um, so that's that's why that's what I say that's worth reading. Now, not only do you, you're actually learning stuff about your world and about the people that are in your world, you're also watching good writers at work. These people know how to create interest. They know how to maintain it. They know how to reward it. They know how to make you turn that page. And if it means that they have to do a hand drawn, a little hand drawing of Hitler's wolf layer, they're going to do it, you know, uh, because they, they want you to get involved with that chapter. And that's arbitrary, stupid goal. Um, but but even from the titles, they know how to spark interest. All right. So what you're what you're getting a chance of doing is you're getting a chance at watching some really good skilled writers at work. There are there are thousands upon thousands of authors, and not every one of them is good at what they do. Okay. I, my hats off to anybody who publishes a book or an article. That's hard enough to do as it's in its own. But 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 again, uh, you know, the question is, which ones have have the real talent, and how can I learn from them? And you know, when I run across books like these, I want to share them with you, like Dead End Gene Pool. Okay, if you read Dead End Gene Pool, I I guarantee you, to your dying day, you're not going to forget it. You're going you might forget me, and you might forget the class, but you're not going to forget Dead End Gene Pool. It's about suicide. It's about uh, the ultra wealthy, the vacuity of wealth, you know, the emptiness there, that that's all you're pursuing. Um, it, it's, it's, uh, it's an incredible book. And, you know, you start on that thing and you realize it's a first person narrative from the little girl that grows into a big girl, you know, you get hooked and, uh, it's just very well written. And, and, and a lot of those books are that way. All right. So, um, see the thing is, I don't know about you. I know it's it's easy for teachers to just make like these, you know, grand uh, like umbrella like statements all the time. You know, we get into the the groove or whatever. And, and, and then we end up saying stuff that, you know, it's like maybe we overspoke. So, you know, I'm not I don't know about maybe you are reading. Maybe you are very serious about your own growth and you feel the power of that. OK, but and I run into a lot of people that just don't read. I mean, they just don't. And that's, that's fine. Some of them, maybe they don't need to read as much as others read. But I'm talking about like, not at all. Like they're, they're like, they have a zero interest in really like exploration of things. They've lost the curiosity that used to be so, so much a part of our young life. Do you remember, do you remember being a kid and how, how, how that was like what drove you? It's like, you were, you were just curious about things and you love to explore, you love to learn. And somehow for some of us that gets knocked out of us. <laughs> We lose it. And I think we pay the price for that. But some of you, again, I don't know. Please understand, I don't know exactly if, if how many are you are like that. But even if there's one of you, I want you to listen to me. Somehow, you have reached the conclusion that you're, you're not a reader. You don't like to read. It's not for you. No, thank you very much. Whatever. Hurry up and be done, because I'm not going to read this book. And the re I want to suggest to you that maybe you, you've you had, the reason you're that way now is that you've had some really, really, really tough experiences with some very boring books that somebody made you read. Or maybe they were actually good books, but you weren't just, you weren't ready for them. Like Shakespeare. I think, I think a lot of us have read more than one play of Shakespeare, but I wonder how many of us were ever ready for it. Because I've read plays multiple times, and it was only until I was 42 and had those experiences under my belt that I realized how, how important that play was, what that play was actually saying, all right? And if I had just read it once and said, well, I'm done with it, I would never have seen what I, what I saw when I was 42. And I wasn't ready for it until I was 42, you know? Moby Dick. I could never, ever get through Moby Dick. It was, it was, it was a horrible experience for me. Okay. Finally, finally, and, and this was two years ago when I was traveling through Milwaukee, I got an audio book on it. It was a great reader and I was actually ready for it for my time of life. And I felt like the book, 
it was it was an incredible experience. But I, I had to wait till I was 48 for that. All right. What I'm saying is maybe you 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 met the book when you weren't ready for it, or maybe the book was just boring. Books are like people, you know? I mean, you meet the wrong person and then you meet another person that's not right for you and another one, you might be like, forget it. I, I'm not really gonna, it's just not working, right? Just wait till you meet the right one. Wait, wait, wait till you, you, you discover what type of people you are and what kind of people you need in your life and wham, it happens, all right? So what I'm saying is maybe you don't like reading just because you didn't ever get an interesting book to read in the first place. I don't know. It's, it's just one of these theories, okay? But uh, I want you to give it one last shot before you really truly kiss it goodbye. Find some of these books, okay? I, I, I say get two of them. Get two numbers. Pick two numbers. Get the books. And then uh, I want you to read one all the way through. And the other one, I want you to practice those styles of reading. So skip a little bit. Uh, try, try to skim you know, try to, you don't, don't practice all the styles, but, 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 but practice some of those styles on the second one, practice, uh, maybe don't read the whole thing, maybe determine, I'm just going to read uh, half of this, but I'll pick the parts, you know, this part here, the, some in the middle, some at the end, and, and you realize that maybe you can actually get a lot out of a book, even though it feels like you're tearing it up. Okay, so the question is, then, you know, how, how do, how do you check these books out? And, um, I'm sort of running out of time here, but maybe I, maybe I can do that. I mean, let, let's let's go ahead and try this. Um, I mean, like 17 minutes less, but uh, oof. oh yeah, uh, for, for the actual reading nonfiction narrative, I don't want you to write anything. So I think I, I had a question here: is like, what would you like to write for the assignment? No, I just want you to read it. I just want you to enjoy it. I mean, if if, if you pick a book and you don't like it, send it back, get another book. I want you to find a book that you actually enjoy reading in that list and read the whole thing. That's all I want you to do. You tell me you read it, you get four points. You tell me you read another one, another one of those numbers, I'll give you another four points. That's eight points right there. Okay. Um, and and I don't want you, well, another challenge is can you use the library system to get these books? Okay. So let's go ahead and I'm going to try to share my screen see if I can do this quickly. Uh, okay, time out. Uh, I, I might have to do another video about how to check it out from the library and all that, because I'm getting some questions here that I think uh, I, I, I want to answer now. Sorry to be jumping around like this, but uh, one here is what can we what can we expect to grade in our first paper? I was just looking for some feedback on mine since I haven't written anything. Yeah, uh, I'm going to grade. Uh, you, you should have all the grades in by Monday. Okay, I'm going to start tomorrow and then uh, I'm just going to work through. I've got stuff from Kent from Akron. You know, the first papers are in now, so I'm going to be grading them. Now, remember, um, uh, the way I – let me take a, a couple minutes here to remind you that there's a video in the start here section that talks about how I grade, and I want I want to talk about that now too, okay? So I, I often have a, a lot of papers to, to read and to grade through, and I don't know exactly how much feedback you want as an individual, okay? I know that if I spend uh, 40 minutes on each paper, then uh, I can easily spend up to 20 to 30 hours just on one school, and the schools are never going to be paying me a full-time wage. They're just not going to do it. All right, I'm adjunct, and I never get more than three classes because if they give me a fourth class, by law, they have to give me health insurance, and they're not going to do that. They don't want me as a full-time person because they don't want to provide health insurance for me and for some other reasons as well. But they are not paying me a full-time wage. So I'm never going to spend all that time creating papers for just once. So here's how I work it, all right? Um, and I'm asking you to consider the fairness of the big picture as well, all right? And that's part of it, is the mechanics of the adjunct underclass and what's happening there. But um, I, I will look through your work. I'm going to initially assign you a score. So if it's, if it's out of seven points or out of 10 points, then I'll, I'll read it and then I'll, I'll say, here's eight out of 10 or nine out of 10. Um, and then what I'm doing, okay, and, and I, I want you to truly believe me on this, is that I'm, I'm waiting for you to identify yourself if you want to revise it. Then I'm waiting for you to reach out to me as in a text, a phone call, or an email and saying, Dr. Horn, you know, I got eight out of 10, and I would really like to earn those two points. Can you, can you tell me how I can earn them? 
And then I will say, now here's what I think. I think the title was this. I think maybe the two paragraphs that you had could be combined into one. I think the ending was kind of, you know, maybe you can delete that. Maybe bring in this. I'll give you a lot of feedback. And how I'll do it is I'll just, I'll respond verbally to a voice recording and then I'll send it to your email. And I think the very best way to do this is if you want feedback that way uh, on, on a paper, uh, copy and paste it into an email and then email it to me, okay? And 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 just simply ask for feedback and, and how you can improve it. And since I can see it right there in the email, I'll be able to give you a very quick response. And I'll either write it out or I'll, I'll probably just record it as an audio clip. And the way the reason I like to do that is that then you have it back in your email box and you can play my, my comments and you can look at the essay at the same time and you can play it over and over and over again, you know, and then uh, you can revise it, resubmit it. I regrade, you get the new grade. So you can actually revise your work as many times as you want to until you get the grade that you want. All right. Um, alternatively, you don't have to revise your work if if you're okay with your score. Okay. I, I do not have required revision. Um, and part of that is 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 I just need to find out where you are in this class and what your goals are and what you're trying to do. And uh, I, 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 I need to make sure that I, I reserve my time for those that like, you know, actually want to revise it or want to get some points. Because if you're like, hey, I made nine out of 10 points, I'm super busy. I've got a big algebra test coming up or whatever. I'm OK with this. I'm just going to I'm just going to move on to another to work folder three. Then I'm like, that's fine. You know, that's fine. Move on and let's 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 work on that essay, you know. Um, so you don't, you don't have to revise your work, but you're welcome to do it if you want to, you know, earn maybe some of the points that you may have missed. All right. And, um, uh, that's, that's how I'm going to, that's how I do it. All right. So please, uh, wait till you see the score. And then if you want to begin the process of, you know, making a perfect score on the essay, then go ahead and contact me via email and send me your work and we'll, we'll get going. Um, See, the thing is, I know I can always find your essay online, okay? But I, I know myself, and the more that you help me help you, the more you're going to get your response sooner than later, okay? Because if I have to go back and find your essay, and I might put it off, I'll be like, yeah, I'll, I'll do that when I get home. And then, you know, when I get home, I'm like, oh, I'll do that after supper. And then before you know it, it's two days later, okay? So uh, you, have my, you have my tri C address, all right? It's, you know, Matthew Horn at Tricy. There's a there's a dot between my name and my last name, Matthew Horn. But um, I, I want to present to you, I want to give you my Kent address because I try to check my Tricy address often, but really it's my Kent address that I check all the time, right? And that is uh, M H O. R N three at Kent dot E D U. Okay. And if you email me to that address and you, you, you know, you have your, your essay just copied in there or as an attachment, whatever I, I can, I can do that. Even if I'm sitting there at Kent, you know, between classes or whatever, I can open it up. I can do that. I can give you some feedback. I can send it and boom, you're on your way. Okay. So I don't give any comments out. The, the first scoring is holistic, but then I'm waiting for you to identify yourself to let me know that you want feedback and then we start that, okay? And I, it's worked well for me for about 10 years. And, and as you know, I feel like this is kind of a way for me to save some of my energy um, and also to really find the ones that want help and need it and I can focus on them, okay? So uh, I hope that was a, a clear answer. Now. Bremen, you have something here that says, do you want us to talk about it as proof at all? I, I'm not sure what you're what you mean there. If you're saying that when you write your research paper. Oh, the OK. Um, no, you don't need to. You, you, you don't you don't you can just uh, just, you know, let me know when you're done. You know, I, I'll, I'll have a I'll have in Blackboard. I'll have sort of a like a a quiz that's that's going to be marked as zero points, right? But 
Well, I'll make sure that it's, it's entered in as extra credit. That's what I mean. But to, all you have to do is affirm that you've done the reading. Uh, so I hope that that explains it there. Um, self self affirmation. So you know what? Hey, can can people can people cheat on this? Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, yeah, they can. Uh, how, how do I feel about that? Conflicted, but uh, don't cheat. You know, you know. Can I ask you not to cheat? It's just not my style to load it all up with, you know, all this stuff that people do to try to catch the cheaters. You know, I feel like uh, in principle, you really shouldn't be cheating this way because, you know, you're going to get very comfortable with it. And sooner or later, you're going to slip up, you know, and um, it's just best not to to be in the habit of lying and, and, and cheating like that. But, yeah, this is kind of weird to hear a teacher say this, but like I know there are gray areas <laughs> where it's like. I don't know. You'll just have to make the decision and live with it, okay? But uh, like AI, right? Artificial intelligence. I I'm telling you, across the nation, uh, the humanities departments. Yeah, that's right, about fabric of reality. Thank you very much. Uh, but ac across the nation, uh, English departments, history departments, philosophy departments, the soft sciences, they're going, they're panicking because this idea of, well, how do we know, you know, that whether our students wrote this essay or not because of AI, you can, you can ask, and it's just getting better. It's just getting harder to detect. And I'm like, you know, that's because you're teaching it the wrong way. <laughs> you know, you, you need to, you need to have much more live discussion or, uh, you know, if, if people can really use AI to write essays, then we need to figure out how to embrace that because that's going to be your future. You know, why your boss is going to ask you to write that, or you're going to be in a position where you're asking someone else to write using AI. I mean, it's just there. It's like a calculator, right? I mean, didn't we have the same discussion about calculators when they first came in? So we all need to go deeper in terms of what we're teaching and why we're teaching. And what we really need to be focusing on are things like joy, love, integrity. And how in the world do you teach that in an English class? And how do you test on it, right? So that's why we don't know how to talk about these things. But that's actually what's at play. See, I, I'm talking about joy and love here because whatever you build right and you're proud of, you want to share it with other people. That's that's just part of what we what we are. You learn that skill of painting and you paint that beautiful picture. The vast majority of us that do that, we want to share it with other people because when we share it, when we when we let other people look at it, our joy grows, and it's an act of love. And that's what I mean that these things are connected at a deeper level. I mean, when when you when you learn how to how to talk to that group of a hundred people and you give them something interesting, you're going to feel the power of of capturing their attention. And you're going to realize that that's delicious. And you're going to realize you know how to do it now. And you're going to respect that. You're going to do it right. You're going to help them grow. And that's love, you know, in, in that arena, in that, in that respect. And that, that has nothing to do with artificial intelligence. You know, you can't get a bot to do that for you. So I feel like uh, a lot of the stuff that's happening now is actually very uh, salubrious. It's, it's, it's healthy for us because it's putting us back on track. We need to move away from just giving facts and testing on facts. We have to now talk about invention, about method of thinking, about all sorts of really better things. And, and we also have to talk about integrity. We, that, that's why I just tell you, you know what? Just don't cheat. <laughs> you know, you don't read the books. Just, just don't do the quiz. And I think I'm going to have so much respect for you down the line if I ever find out about that. But you can have a lot of self-respect by not doing that. You know, that's important. So anyway, hey, it's 9.15. I've got somewhere I've got to be actually a tennis court. So thank you for sticking with me and, you know, paying attention. And, uh, you know, you're always welcome to talk with me on the phone, send me a text, say hi, whatever you want to do, you know, uh, call me, send me an email. Don't be a stranger if you don't want to be one. And uh, I'll see you on Monday. Okay. Yeah. I'm glad that you guys are reading this book. So I didn't realize that. And I'm glad that you're liking those books. Deep is a good book. Okay. Keep at it. All right. Great. I'll see you guys on Monday.